Ice Stories Live. Concise, just about the same size as your Gideon's Bible. <laughs> but now, of course, you've condensed it quite a lot of years. Can I add one more? One more. Of course, thing? you can. Yes. It's very precious, as Alan prayed. It just Lord brought brought it up to me again because here's the thing: the the question, uh, the question: Why God conspired such a complicated thing? taking men halfway around the world to the hostile country just to meet one guy, lead him to the Lord and come back. And actually, later on, I learned when Dave Asala, this gentleman, he shared it with me when he prayed about the trip. Lord spoke to him two words, one soul. And he kind of didn't see it significant enough. So he dismissed that thought. And he prayed and continually, every time he prayed about that trip, God reminded him of these two words, one soul. And when he was flying back on the plane, he prayed again, and Lord reminded him of these, these two words, one soul. And, and that that's really speaks to me, volume of God's character and his love for us, because, I mean, we, when we... We say we say these lofty statements now. If you would be only a sinner, God would send his son just for you, which is true. But to me, it's not just the lofty words. It's, it's reality because God didn't think it's too complicated, too expensive, too hard to take one man halfway around the world into a hostile country and lead one man, one soul to the Lord. And this soul happened to be me. And, and I know he, he does it for each and every one of us uniquely. He's, he's a good shepherd. So that's, thank you, Alan, for that prayer, because that's, that's pretty much communicates exactly what Lord revealed about himself for me. Thank you, Dimitri, for uh, telling us that. Now, of course, you weren't always a Christian, always no. a believer. <laughs> um, I see you were born in the mid-60s. Uh, tell 60. us what life was like for a young boy growing up in Soviet Russia. Was it difficult? Was it easy? Okay. What was it like? Some people were raised by wolves. I was raised by KGB uh, members and uh, professional communist preachers. My dad was the propagandist. That's the guy who keeps everybody straight in the communist doctrine and the scientific institute. And my mom worked for KGB and she was, <clears throat> it was kind of a dynasty because her mom and dad, my grandpa and grandma also. So imagine I had to use quite a quite a secrecy, you know, when I was translating that Bible and, and I had to record it. I, I had a notebook because by the time I've checked the last word, I've already forgot what the first one meant. So I had to write it down and I thought I'm hiding it really well. But at the moment when my mom was still working for KGB and, and all of that situation opened up for me and my wife to go to the Bible school, it was 1990. And, and I knew I had to tell my mom because I, till the very last moment, I didn't, I, I, I didn't think it would work out. And, and I told my mother that story, how, I, how it's all happened. And I looked, looked up, at, uh, at her. I actually closed my eyes. I didn't even look in mom's <laughs> eyes because her, she could be pretty stern, you know? And then when I, I, I asked, please do not interrupt. I'll just tell you everything and, and, and I'm not asking your permission. It's decided. I just want you <laughs> to know what's happening. And then when I looked up at her after the end of my story, I saw a tear sparkling in her eye and she said, uh, a couple of years ago when I was cleaning your desk and I ran, I, I found this notebook <laughs> and I thought I'm hiding it really well, but she was professional. So she, <laughs> found it and she, she said, I read it and it seems, seems to me, it's not just a kind of youthful trend or something like that. It's pretty serious. I said, Oh yes. <laughs> it's very serious. <laughs> so, and it was greatest gift before going to, so to the Bible school, we prayed with my mom and she received Jesus. Wow. And what about your dad? Did she tell your dad what was happening? Yes, dad, with dad, well, my parents divorced when I was a kid. Okay. So, and, you know, it, it was, I mean, 
I, I was actually, I didn't see much difference because there was, they were kept fighting. They still lived in the same communal apartment and they still kept fighting. So to me, it was, I didn't see any difference, mm -hmm. divorced or married, but they were always like fighting like dog and a cat. And my dad was a harder case because to him, it's very hard to admit that all of his life, he believed the lies and indoctrinated people in the lies. He was, he was pretty honest man. You know, he was, he had that integrity. He, and he sincerely believed what he shared with the people, what, what he indoctrinated and told people. But again, uh, and it was, it was a very unique moment too. My grandma was still alive. And, and here we, we were, me, my wife, our daughter, me and grandmother and and my dad, her son. So we had four generations holding hands and praying together. Wow. And it's just like, you know, when, when, when the four generations that, that the, the, the Bible teaches about the curse that being inherited through the generations. So we cut that, we reversed that curse and these four generations were connected again and prayed. And my dad given his life to the Lord. Praise God. My grandma just a few months before she passed away. So it was it was an incredible gift. So basically all, all of my relatives, you know, immediate family, they became Christians. And my dad is going to be with the Lord too. So is my mom. Fantastic. Now when you are actually translating the this Bible and do you think it was dangerous? Was there a danger of you getting caught and be maybe sent to Siberia or someplace like that? Well, here, here's the thing. You know, uh, I yeah, with this kind of a bright book, it, it was very, it, it would be attracting too much attention. So we had the newspaper, which <laughs> Pravda, it means truth. <laughs> so I wrapped that book in this newspaper. So kind of hiding the bright orange color. <laughs> and, and so, and it said the truth. <laughs> Excellent. So, yeah, Excellent. yeah. Well, and, and we we had, like, for example, in the 90s, when when I, I, I got saved and we shared with our friends, with colleagues, and basically we had home meetings. And I became a pastor before I knew what pastor was. <laughs> And only for the reason because I had a Bible, nobody else had. <laughs> and, and we had it like just like home meetings, but disguised as a birthday party. We had the cake that kind of that would, was so fragile, so old that it would break if we dropped it. And and so and, and the people gathered, and somebody heard 
the story from the grandmother. And I shared something that I read in the book and tried to understand it, try to make sense of all of that. And then the paintings, of course, helped. So that was, that was our journey kind of in 86, 87, 88. So, and Excellent. Yeah, home, like, like basically it was a home church. Well, if there's any, uh, I also got saved through a Gideon, small Gideon's Bible as well. But that was that was in 1972. But so yeah, it, it's fantastic what the Word of God could do. But before that, of course, um, you said you were into art. You had an intrinsic uh, interest in art. Right? Uh, what was it that gave you the interest in art? Do you think? Why did you like it so much? You know, uh, well, I don't know. I I I like drawing since I was a kid, and I was I was studying in the art school. And then it's continued on and into the basically developed into a career of a restoration, art restoration. And I knew I will never be without a job because there's so much art and so many museums in St. Petersburg. Mm -hmm. There's always something has to be done. So and and besides, I loved it. I loved to study it. And there is open just discovering the secrets because there's lots of artists just for example, take Rembrandt Harmens von Rijn. He is so uh, he's so amazing in terms of the coding certain things and subliminal hidden messages in his painting. And of course, it's an incredible skill because it's not just a snapshot of the of the thing or just just a picture like a photograph, but the artist compresses the entire story. He puts the entire story in the in a small format or a format of the painting, an aesthetic picture. And, and you could see these dynamics. You could see in a lot of different interesting clues. And I keep discovering it. It's, it's amazing. It's like a parable. It keeps getting growing on you and you get deeper and get more understanding of it. So I, I always admired it. It's, a, it's a such a unique uh, way of communicating. Mm -hmm. And it transcends all the cultures and languages. And the most amazing thing that, yeah, the communists eliminated all the Bibles. They made the like official religion is atheism in the country. And still the silent preaching of the paintings, they, <laughs> they, were, they were hitting the straight into the heart. You mentioned Rembrandt and that, but was it the same with the Russian art or was that more religious, the Russian art? Russian art, I mean, before the revolution, Russian art was also very religious. I mean, there are lots of Russian painters, the Russian museum, and actually going back into the, like six, seven centuries, the 10th, 13th, for example, the icon painting, the famous Andrei Rublev, Trinity, and there is a Phil uh, van Greek, and starting with, and, and how it's evolved too, because the, the icon painting, of course, there was trying to capture the doctrine of the church. But further on, it's developed in the 17, 18, 19th century. It's became more uh, just kind of like a renaissance. Mm -hmm. They're bringing the Bible, the gospel into the contemporary today's life. It was not something distant, happened some, some time ago in a long ago in a distant century, but it's, it's really, it's, it is relevant for today. That's why a lot of Renaissance painters dressed all the biblical uh, heroes in this Renaissance fancy garment. <laughs> it's so funny. but <laughs> It seems to have spoken to you because you, you, you could see in the pictures what you were reading in the Bible, so to speak, the stories, as you said. But yeah. uh, did you work on any famous pieces? Um, what was the most famous piece you ever worked on? Well, I, I didn't work on the paintings. My, my, my work was mostly mosaic. It was a, a marquetry, like the carving wood, or uh -huh. the, just a floor, or like the wood mosaic, or the or the actual mosaic with a with a glass smalta. So we, I worked for a short period of time at the Church of the Resurrection in Saint Petersburg. That's a unique church. It's the how do you? It's a, it's a church. It's it's quite. Uh, I mean, it's. It's pretty young church. It was mm -hmm. built right before the revolution, but it's fully decorated by mosaic. And there is some of the some of the most of the amazing pieces there. So my 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 brother-in-law worked there, his wife, and so and, and there are different different places like that. My wife, 
she worked in uh, Catherine's Palace in Pushkin. Wow. And she she's a gilder. She gilded the gate of the of the uh, the Catherine's oh. Palace there. Plus, she she also gilded few pieces in the in, in the uh, Amber Room. Amber Room is a unique hall that fully decorated by amber mosaic. Wow, so. fantastic! Now you said, of course, you met this guy three times <laughs> in the place of five million people, and you said you saw a pair of yellow boots and a big smile. What attracted you the most was it the yellow boots or the big smile? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the, the 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 yellow boots. I think they kind of stuck stuck in my head. I mean, you, I could you could spot them from anywhere, but of course the smile it, it's it was very different because a very different opinion uh, appearance of a person because the Russians don't smile like that. But the, the most amazing thing that when he was start pointing at the at the mosaic there at the Jesus of Ascension. Mm -hmm. And and obviously he was he, he was telling me who who he is and, and what's going on there. He was telling me the story behind the painting, which I didn't know at the time. Mm -hmm. And that's I felt like he knows something. Wow. So that that was the drive really at that moment. <laughs> As I say, it obviously stirs something in you. Are you are you actually saying that Russians don't have a sense of humor, that they don't smile or have a good laugh? <laughs> no, we do, they do, but it's it's kind of a grim sense of humor, you know. <laughs> Especially if you're if you've been growing and living in the communist times, you know. Yeah, Russians lo like to joke, but it's we we also know that the joke can cost you. A lot. you well, not anymore. I suppose at that time when you, before the wall came down. Now, you said at the time, of course, um, in 1990, you were still under Soviet Russia. And the opportunity came to go to America. How did that come about for you? Stories Live. Life Stories. That's something that I, I really, that was not my faith. I have to admit it because Dave Vassala, the gentleman in the yellow boots, <laughs> he was able to come back to St. Petersburg in 88, 1988, two years later. And that time when he brought the, some Russian Bibles, this time he was able to do that. So and that, that was an exciting thing. And by that, by that time, I spoke a little bit of English. I could, I could communicate a little bit. And of course, conversational part was kind of behind because I could read and I could understand what it's written, but the that I never practiced it. So I never had the conversational part of English language uh -huh. kind of coming in. So, but Dave, we communicated, I, I could understand him. And he said, would you like to come to America to study Bible? <laughs> Can you imagine? And he yeah. asked the kid who's living in, in the, behind the Iron Curtain, still in the Soviet Union. And still at that time, there were people who persecuted for their belief. Uh -huh. So there were, there were, there were people in prison for that. 
Uh -huh. So I said, well, okay, <laughs> uh, did you forget what we were? We live like in a big concentration camp behind the bar barbed wire. Nobody, who would let me go to America? And he yeah. said, but, but would you? And I said, of course, it would be great to visit someday. But I mean, to me, it was unreal. It was like, uh -huh. you know, God visited Abraham and Sarah. And he said, you, in a year, you will have a son. I thought it would it would be impossible. I mean, to me, to my perspective, it was unreal. Then and and but he said, "Would you go if the opportunity? If you have an opportunity?" I said, "Of course, I would." So that's all he needed. He came back to the states. He approached the school board, and he he said, "Would you like to?" Uh, there is some potential Russian students who could come and study. Mm -hmm. Oh, and they approved it. Then and they basically sent us. That was a really complicated thing. They sent us the application forms, of course by mail. Never made it. Then they found some uh, senator who could help with the diplomatic mail to mm -hmm. send it to the to the consulate. Mm -hmm. So and and they gave me a phone number and I'm calling the consulate and they said no no nothing came no no so. And I'm calling and calling, and it's just a month go by and nothing transpired. So finally, there's some people who are coming as a tourist. They, they, they actually came as couriers. They took these application forms, we filled them up, they came back, and so on. The process started. And later on, when Dave was able to come, come back again to St. Petersburg before actually us going to the, to the States for the school, we went to the consulate. And, uh, and, and I would never forget that. And inquired, we were sending the mail through the congressman, you know, and it was supposed to be here and it's an application for some uh, potential Russian students. And they said, tell your congressman that we're not a post office. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that was, it was, they were silent too. They didn't say anything. Anyway. You mentioned the difficulty there, but I mean, did you ever think while you were in Russia at the time, growing up in Soviet Russia, that I mean, that it would all change, that you would, you know, um, so we said that the wall would come down. Did you ever think you would ever escape um, communism and stuff like that? You know, it, it was very hard. I mean, I were, of course, we were, I mean, we were dreaming like all, all the young people. We had mm -hmm. dreams. And of course, you know, uh, then gravity <laughs> just reminded us that we were born in the wrong country for such a dreams. So, but it's amazing what God can do. And, and it's really, and, and I realized that God was behind all of these dreams. Because we, we were able to come to the States and study and, and even, even just do a little detail. It, it was like the, it was a precision work of the Holy spirit because God knew that we need an English language to study in the Bible school uh -huh. aids. So that's why this Bible was in English and not, not in Russian in the first place and, and so on and so forth. So, and, and, and I, th I think it was all of that is a, is a very, very important link. It was just coming together. And, and I think it was amazing how Holy Spirit just guides us and a lot of times we think it's like inconvenience or intervention or something like that, but it's actually a part of the plan and it just works out perfectly in the end. Now you mentioned as well in your story, you thought to yourself, well, why would someone come 9,000 miles to preach the gospel when you said that you mentioned there were, there were some Christians in Russia. Were there many Christians in Russia at that time? Or were they in hiding? Or yeah, yes, they, they were they were Christians, and of course there was this, always there was underground church. Mm -hmm. But again, that's that's the name underground. So mm -hmm. they were trying to stay low profile, you know, just uh, stay under the radar. But the the church was there. And how were you aware of it? Was this afterwards you found out, or were you aware that they were actually there at the time? I, I actually, I came, I, I came to know about it much later. Mm -hmm. and of course, and of course, met the people and met the people who, who have been in prison for for their faith, and 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 we met the people who were actually born, and there was, I mean, it was like second or third generation of believers who were born, and and they've seen all of that. And they heard the stories from their grandmothers and 
and, and grandfathers. Now, Dimitri, of course, you said it was a tough time getting to America, but when you got on the plane and landed in America, how big a culture shock was it to you? <laughs> it was it was really big. Was it? Well, you know, well, before the, before that, let me tell you the first. We we actually were exposed to some. Um, uh, we were in, in some capitalist countries. We were in Germany, West Germany, uh, <laughs> namely West Berlin. Before, with my wife on at work, we were in Charlottenburg, which is the. It's like uh, similar. It's a twin palace of the uh, Catherine's palace. I Same see. Word. Same. It's just. And we met, we worked with the restorers there. So, and it was in exactly, it was in April of 1990, April. And, you know, in August, the Berlin Wall came down. So, yeah. and it, it was amazing to see two worlds at the same time, like kind of like at a, at a glance, because we, we could cross, we could cross that line between East and West Berlin. Mm -hmm. And we could see, and actually I had a film back then, it was before digital cameras, I had a film camera and I took pictures on both sides. And when I developed the film, I thought the half of the film is actually blemished because it seems like half of the film is monochrome and, the, and another one is, is full color, but even the weather changed. I know it's kind of strange, <laughs> sounds strange, but when we just like, 50 meters we walked through across that passage and we we i stories live